Dear participants, if I understand well, this afternoon has been devoted to a crossing of borders. We have already crossed the border with the Luchador previously, but I'd like to put an incentive on this crossing of borders and look at the cover with you, which I find extremely interesting, as personally interested in Chicano movements in both the United States and what is apparent in Mexico concerning Chicanos. So I would like to point out to you the icons that you see there. On this mascara, which is supposed to be certainly the Lucha Libre in Mexico, I see the icon that is both Aztec but has been taken up by the Chicano movement of Justici the Justicialist Movement of California in Denver in 1965 that has been taken up by Chicanos. It's exactly the illustration that you see there. So there is a play on words there. Lucha Libre, yes. And also Lucha, which means political. Lucha Politica para la liberación de los proletarios americanos. So I see there the huelga which is the eagle, and also the strike. So it is the idea of associating the Aztec eagle with the strike that the Mexicans who immigrate to the United States, and we shall have occasion to mention this later on. This association is one of the first syncretic aspects of Lucha Libre that I'd like to mention here. Do not be afraid, I shall not communicate fully but I'd like to mention a second aspect that is linked with Lucha Libre. It is the syncretic aspect within Mexico. So I'd like to uh, project a vision of Lucha Libre that is not that of Anglo-Americans looking at Mexico, which means crossing the border south. But I'd like to go in the other direction and rather see it from inside, which has been brought to Bonn previously, I think. So seen from inside, the syncretism is not due only to a taste for the Mexican public, for the mass consumption of monsters and uh, whatever, the, the superheroes of US culture and the Hollywoodian aspect of that culture. I think it's linked primarily to the deep felt feeling that Aztecs are in fact neo indigenists at heart. So this indigenism is present in Lucha Libre. So the Aztec gods who were called Oseotl and uh, you know, the, the um, jaguar warriors of ancient Mexico are present in Lucha Libre. And La Mascara, which was mentioned before, <coughs> the Mascara, La Mascara de Plata, the, the, the silver mask, the red mask, the spotted mask, are all reminiscent of the Aztec gods. So I'm not saying that popular culture is absolutely built or anchored in a neo-indigenous culture. That would be a vision of intellectuals, and I don't want to sponsor this idea. But there is something in the soul, in the feelings, in the popular vision of Lucha Libre that is actually reminiscent of the ancient gods that had been suppressed by Hispanic culture. So you may see that I have a very Chicano outlook on Lucha Libre, so I am going to abandon this. We may talk about this later in our activities, but I shall certainly now uh, introduce the two um, communications for today. And uh, so we shall start with Jane Bailey, who is a maître de conférence at Nantes University, who teaches U.S. civilization, U.S. history, because civilization is a big word in English. So she wrote a PhD, uh, Presse et nationalisme, le cas du magazine Life de 44 à 50. She is a researcher in uh, the art of photography and photojournalism. She is most interested in contemporary photography. So uh, in this mode and to this aim, she will communicate 
on professional wrestling and contemporary photography, the case of Dulce Pinthons, the real story of superheroes. Thank you very much. Um, indeed, I am not at all a specialist of professional wrestling. Um, it was more that I was very interested in the, um, the photographs by um, Dulce Pinson. And um, then I saw the call for papers, and I said, oh, goodness, it's just made for me. So um, I decided to, uh, make a to make a proposal for the communications, and thank you very much for accepting um, this paper. So today um, I'm going to be talking about, as uh, she said, the case of Dosi um, the real story of the superheroes. Roland Barthes writes in The World of Wrestling that professional wrestling is an open-air spectacle. Um, Dolce Pinzan, a young Mexican artist living in New York, took him literally by photographing Mexican immigrant workers in superhero and wrestling garb and placed them on the streets of New York in order to attract the spectator's eye and to focus attention on what Pinzani considered unnoticed heroic acts. El Santo protests in the streets among dissatisfied workers. Captain America arrests a lawbreaker. Catwoman takes care of young children. Well, this project would become internationally renowned and win Dolce Pinzan much acclaim, it could be argued that much of the popularity of her photographic series and its universal appeal is contingent upon her use of costume. Take away the costumes and the whole series loses much of its resonance. Christophe Lamoureux, thank you very much. <laughs> he wrote and he explains, Dans le rituel de la parade du catch, le costume de scène donne au divertissement sa dimension théâtrale. Ce que le surnom dit du rôle, l'habit de catch montre, de visu, toujours avec hyper signifiant, peignoir, juste au corps, cagoule, masque, chaussures, gants, coiffure et accessoires divers composent une surenchère dans la désignation des types moraux à interpréter par les lutteurs. While pertaining to pro wrestling, his quote reveals much of the parallels between Pinzan's photographs and professional wrestling, use of costume, narrative, excess, and morality. In fact, all three fo art forms, contemporary photography, pro wrestling, and superhero comic books, rely heavily on the costume to define the notion of hero, as well as provide an imaginative blending of fact and fiction, of a subject and its allegorical and psychological significance. What definition of hero is illustrated in Dolce Pisani's contemporary photographic series, The Real Story of the Superheroes, and is it consistent with her, defi her definition established in the presentation of her project? What is the relation between her hero and the wrestling face? And can this help the viewer understand who the villain is? Does the discourse of pro wrestling allow Pinzani to anchor the meaning more solidly? The first aim of this presentation is to identify the objective of Pinzani's photograph series and how she visualized, visually conceptualized the notion of hero. Then we will question how the understanding of pro wrestling and the superhero discourse deepens the complexity of Pinzani's photographic message that at first glance appears quite clear and simple. Professional wrestling and Pinzan's superhero photo series are both visual experiences made for the masses. Roland Barthes writes again in Mythologies. He clarifies that wrestling is not a sport, it's a spectacle. Indeed, multiple studies have proven the relationship between pro wrestling and theater. However, as Dalbier Assembi remarks, culturally, when we think of art, we don't think of professional wrestling. Pro wrestling occupies the status of what he says, low art appealing to the working class, the masses, ever since its beginnings in taverns in postbellum New York's Bowery District in the early 19th century. From the, tavern, from the tavern stage to the carnival tent, the music hall to the gymnasium, auditorium, and finally the Superdome, wrestling has been a sport of the people expected to be performed in front of an audience. Now on the other hand, art, not to be confused with commercial photography, Thanks to the unrelenting efforts of Alfred Stiglitz, as high art, photography has its place side by side paintings and sculpture. 
As such, our photography is usually intended for an elite, informed audience in museums. Even though Dolce Panzani's photographs, photography belongs to the contemporary uh, photography genre, typically found in museums, she has specifically made this series available to a mass audience. She participated in the renowned photography festival Les Rencontres d'Arle in France. She has also taken part in Photo Ireland Festival in Dublin, another one in Bogota, Colombia. Her work has appeared in numerous magazines and newspapers, including Marie Claire, Mother Jones, Rolling Stone, The New York Times, The Guardian, The Washington Post, just to name a few. Um, in addition to museums, she exposes her work in cultural centers such as the FAC and elsewhere. This wide circulation reflects, at the same time, her desire to reach a mass audience and the mass audience providing its interest in her photographic series. Both of these cultural forms are pregnant with visual codes enabling their viewers' understanding. Professional wrestling and photography both offer representations structured around conventions and rules to create these meanings. They are produced according to social and aesthetic contentions. We are going to see the proclivity of the pro wrestling superhero genre to cross boundaries, making Pinzani's photographic series universally appealing, while at the same time supplementing meaning. The title of her book claims the real story of the superheroes. The first question that arises is how does she define her superhero? Dolce Pinzana, a Mexican photographer living in New York since 1995, claims that her, that her series emerged in the wake of 9-11. At the time of the traumatic event, she was an activist in a trade unit, train union working with fellow Mexican immigrants. Inspired by the everyman heroism of New York firefighters and others, Pinzani felt that in, her own, in their own way, the Mexican immigrants living in New York were invisible heroes needing recognition. After, she wrote, after September 11, the notion of hero began to rear its head in the public consciousness more and more frequently. The notion served a necessity in a time of national and global crisis to acknowledge those who showed extraordinary courage or determination in the face of danger, sometimes even sacrificing their lives in an attempt to save others. However, in the whirlwind of journalism surrounding these deservedly front page disasters and emergencies, it is easy to take for granted the heroes who sacrifice immeasurable life and labor in their day-to-day -day lives for the good of others, but do so in a somewhat less spectacular setting. According to Pinzan, the principal objective of this series is to pay homage to these brave and determined men and women that somehow manage without the help of any supernatural power <coughs> to withstand extreme conditions of labor in order to help their families and communities survive and prosper. Their heroism stems from the fact that they work in the worst paid jobs, pay their taxes, and send money back to their family in Mexico. The, Mexin, the Mexican immigrant worker in New York is a perfect example, she says, of the hero who has gone unnoticed. It is a common, it is common for Mexican worker in New York to work extraordinary hours in extreme conditions for very low wages, which are saved at great cost and sacrifice and sent to families and communities in Mexico who rely on them to survive. Her artistic statement specifies textually her objective. The next question is, how did she photographically represent these unsung Mexican heroes? During an interview, she claims that the idea for her project came to her while she was in Mexico at a time of the super hunk hero revival as she was shopping. She, was a, she saw a Spider-Man costume, and the rest is history. In order to represent visually the heroic qualities of the Mexican workers, Pinzani dressed for her fellow Mexican Union members and her neighbors in costumes of members of the Justice League, the Fantastic Four, and other well-known superheroes. As the superhero genre dictates, the action primarily occurs in New York City, Gotham City, or any other fictitious city which creates a possible link to New York City. Pinzani's superheroes were photographed in their workplace and the setting is primarily urban New York. Those photographed outside provide the viewer's eye glimpses of, of skyscrapers, cityscapes, 
restaurants, construction sites, streets, public transportation, such as taxis and subways. Photographed inside, signs of urban life are still clearly visible, buildings are seen in the background and people are eating out, etc. In order to call attention to the hero heroic sacrifice that the subjects make, Pinzani has anchored the meaning of each photograph with a legend that specifies each superhero by his or her real Mexican identity, his or her hometown, and how much remittance is sent back to Mexico each week, as you can see under the picture that I've put. I actually wanted to send around, because I have the book, I haven't put up all the pictures. So while I'm talking, we can look at them. Or you copied mine before I did. The photographic genre also contributes to the identification of the Mexican subjects as heroes. In an interview, Pinzani placed her work in what she referred to as fictional, uh, fictional documentary. The costume-clad Mexicans make the fictional manifest. In contemporary photography, storytelling may make obvious references to fables, fairy tales, events, and modern myths that are already part of our collective consciousness. In this case, the superhero costumes reinforce Pinzana's objective to make her art universal and widely recognizable by all classes. Yet at the same time, the workplace setting and the anchorage situate the photographic series in the documentary genre. Since the 19th century, when Ries and Heinz used a phot photography to raise consciousness of how the other half lives, this genre has focused on the isolated and the excluded. Unlike the humanist tradition of documentary that uses black and white photography, Pinzani explodes color. Thus, the photographs read much less like social, social commentary and criticism than they do satire. It is, in fact, the fusion of the two genres, both fictional and documentary, that create the power of Pinzani's photographic series. Without the trope of costume, much of the impact would be lost. Imagine these same pictures of these subjects photographed in their everyday attire. Indeed, functioning as simple documentary wouldn't have been nearly as effective nor popular in meeting Pinzan's objective of paying homage to unnoticed heroes. Another aspect contributing to the universal appeal of Pinzani's series and the portrayal of Mexicans as heroic stems from Pinzani's specific choice of superheroes. Despite her Mexican origins, in her final project, the publication of the series in a photo book format that I've sent around, she intentionally excluded perhaps the most appropriate symbolic hero for her message, El Santo. El Santo, who wouldn't be, or at least less recognized by the majority of Americans, was left out by the of the publication of her book. Instead, emphasis was given to American superheroes. Despite the elimination of El Santo from her publication, we can still find it on what to appears to be an older version of her internet website, as can be clearly seen by this um, capture of the screen. Here what we have is El Santo, the activist in a depiction echoing acts of his character as inspired in Mexico, Super Barrio, and other political activists who use the, the Lucha Libre hero to promote their social political agenda. Indeed, Pinzan's Mexican superhero subjects seem to meet the criteria for superheroes. Uh, Peter uh, Coogan, in his article, The Definition of Superhero, defines them as a heroic character with a selfless pro-social mission. And um, I go through each one, and I'm going to actually skip them because we saw them, but basically the mission, we see the self-objectness as they are working for the other's identity through the costume and superpowers. Well, they don't have many, but neither does Captain America, and he's still a superhero. So that's going to let me save a little time and jump to what is really the heart of the subject, the contributions um, to Pinzani's photograph series from professional wrestling. Now, inasmuch as the lines between spectacle, sport, television, entertainment, and theater blurred with professional wrestling, certain codes are present in wrestling that seep over into Pinzani's photographs imparting a more complex notion of hero. They include costume, excess, and narrative. These codes seem to weaken Pinzani's hero discourse by rendering it more ambiguous. The costume and excess. In both, let's see, yep, we're okay. 
In both the superhero and the wrestling genre, the costume is what makes the hero manifest. Um, Christophe uh, Lamoureux specifies yet again in his book that wrestling is an eye-catching connotation. Comme les codes excessifs de l'apparence physique et de la présentation de soi, le costume est suffisamment stéréotypé pour fonctionner immédiatement à la fois comme attrape-regard et comme puissant connecteur d'intention. Thus, the costume is, n is a necessity of character, establishing their role visually for its audience. It is essential for identification for the characters. The wrestlers assume they're highly are highly stylized. Thus, the costume becomes symbolic of how the wrestler will act in the ring based upon the role he will play. The excess of the wrestler's costume accordingly guarantees an immediate recognition of the wrestler as either heel, the villain, or a face, the hero. And likewise, the superhero's costume places his actions in a comprehensible context, and it announces who the superhero is and explains what he is doing. Now, this distinction isn't quite so cut and dry as Pinzani would like it to be. Pinzan, Pinzani's idea to dress grown adults up in Halloween costumes, stick them in their work environment where tensions may already be running high, and take their picture is quite excessive, even if it has clearly defined the subject as the hero. Or has it? One could easily scoff contemptuously at the derision as another could appreciate the joke. In any case, this could have been, this could have a counter effect. Instead of admiring the Mexicans' courageous endeavors, the viewer could also question the seriousness of the heroic Mexican. At the same time, the superhero genre leaves the viewer to understand that where there is a superhero, evil forces must be lurking not too far away. As for wrestling, uh, Morton and O'Brien in their book, Wrestling to Wrestling, remind us that it is social by its very nature and to exist requires the other, friend or foe. The oddity in Pinzoni's photo series is that the other is not immediately apparent. The question then arises, who or what is the evil force? The superhero has been made obvious, but the evil villain much less so. One might suggest the American society is the evil foe, a strange message for so many Americans to embrace. And then again, is it the superhero's alter ego, the real Mexican? Hopefully, the narrative shall shed light on how we are supposed to interpret Pinzani's series. Sharon Mazur, in her sociological study of wrestling, real wrestling, real life, explains that wrestling narrative finds some of its source in current events. She explicates for the fans, not only are the stories that are told to them in the ongoing professional wrestling narratives drawn for life, life itself can be read through the structures and understandings that professional wrestling provides. Current events become material for characters and stories. Now, the time span during which Pinzani worked on her series covers the post 9-11 period until her book was published in 2012. During this time, September 11 terrorist attacks on American soil, soil raised fears of national security that were in turn aggravated by the tumultuous situation of immigration in the US and the ensuing Great Recession increased anxieties about immigrants stealing jobs. Most 21st, tw most 21st century immigrants come from Latin America, especially Mexico. There are an estimated 12 million illegal immigrants in the US, over half of which also come from Mexico. However, at the same time, this undocumented population plays an important role in the US economy, notably in the agricultural, construction, and service sectors. During the Great Recession, this became a great source of tension. Fears that this influx of Mexicans and other Latin American challenges the WASP dominance, both culturally and linguistically. This ethnocentric phobia is formulated by the American academic Samuel Huntington in the issue of foreign policy. He writes, the persistent inflow of Hispanic immigrants threatens to divide the United States into two peoples, two cultures, two languages. Unlike, unlike past immigrant groups, Mexicans and other Latinos have not assimilated into the mainstream US culture, forming instead their own political and linguistic enclaves from Los Angeles to Miami and rejecting the Anglo-Protestant values that built the American dream. The United States ignores this challenge at its peril. 
These and other such arguments push forward legislation for stricter border control and attempts for more restrictive immigration laws at the state level. Through the narrative being played out by the two antagonists in the ring, the audience lives out real frustrations vicariously as political, social, and economic events and conditions are replayed. The wrestling match becomes a form of what Clifford Geertz terms imaginative realism, whereby the struggles, unresolved dif difficulties, and ambiguities of everyday life are acted out for the audience in a way that is exhilarating and meaningful. Pinzani's superheroes are in the ring of American society playing out a larger narrative of American culture and immigrants searching for the American dream. Their dream, the American dream, their dream. The spectators, viewers may cheer them on, hoping that someday they reach their goal or despise them for threatening American workers' job security. The sphere of Mexicans may play into one of the most common tropes in wrestling, the evil foreigner. Evil foreign heels are pitted against a devoted American patriot. The Iron Sheik during the Iron Hostage Crisis, the Russian Nikolai Volkov during the Cold War, and more recently, recently Mohammed, Mohammed Hassan. The question again arises, are Pinzon's subjects representing the American patriot or the evil foreign heel? In light of this social political context, it seems that Pizan used a technique common in wrestling to keep the Mexican worker from being understood as the evil, he, evil foreigner in order to portray him as a hero. The discourse of the minority face. The minority hero, which is a consequence of the civil rights movement on wrestling, symbolizes those pe persons who have fought and will continue to fight to get to the top. Despite all their hardships, just like American folk heroes, their hard work, commitment, virtue, etc., help them succeed while at the same time serve as a reminder that America is a land of opportunity. In his study, Morton explains that the limitations of the wrestling minority, he explains the limitations of the wrestling minority character. A minority member can be a hero only as long as he can be a hero for all of the people. The moment he too distinctly emphasizes his ethnic background, he cannot have widespread appeal. Simply saying the minority may be accepted as a hero as long as he downplays ethnic racial uniquenesses and focuses on American values. This is reflected visually in Pinzang's photo series as nothing specifically denotes Mexican. Looked at from a documentary perspective, the photographs don't illustrate either a murky America visually the superhero's work environment does not appear hazardous, deplorable, nor extreme, just hard, in which other minorities, such as blacks or even teenagers, could work. Like the wrestling minority hero, Pinzani's emphasis is on values, their dedication to their work. Unfortunately for Pinzani's Mexican subjects, she blurs her message of the minority hero by intentionally including the legends. As pointed out earlier, her idea is to emphasize their hard work and sacrifice. Nevertheless, her anchorage draws attention away from the visual hero and refocuses it on the Mexican identity. This evokes the superhero's alter ego. Does Pinzani's superhero embody the superhero everyday man-woman dichotomy like Superman and Kent Clark, or the superhero villain duality like Batman's adversary Two-Face? Or even more confusingly, do her superheroes embody the instability of the contemporary wrestling face whose character may shift across the lines of good and evil? Wrestling heroes and villains are defined chiefly through their opposition as a villain can become a hero by engaging in a feud with one or even more villainous than he or she. Similarly, a hero can become a villain by coming into conflict with a hero more popular than he or she. Hence, the nature of Pinzani's Mexican superheroes is questionable and elusive. Pinzani's hero reflects the ambiguous nature Mexicans have in the American society. Are they to be seen as Mexicans, as Americans, as Mexican Americans, as the devoted American patriot, or the loyal Mexican temporarily working in the United States? As long as they appear to represent American values without ethnic or racial emphasis, they are lauded as the underdog minority. However, if their patriotism may be doubted, 
and their loyalty to the American homeland is uncertain, as could be suspected by the large sums of dollars sent back to Mexico, distrust and suspicion will prevail among Americans. They are indeed, on the one hand, the evil foreign heel, and on the other, the minority underdog diligently applying American values. The perception continues to slide. Not only is the hero heroic nature problematic, the story Panzani has written communicates a narrative of entrapment. As part of the superhero genre, the superheroes are without hope. Occupying a space outside culture, the superhero often serves the function of mediator figure that enters a community in crisis with the aim of resolving its conflicts and restoring the status quo. This lack of hope is in fact present in the narrative, the real story of the superheroes presented through Pranzani's use of tableau photography. Tableau photography is a work in which narrative has been distilled into a single image. Even if they are parts of, a large, of larger works, narrative is loaded into a single frame. Now, the, as a book, as the series advances page after page, Pinzon provides basically a new variant on the same scenario. We have a new superhero or a new uh, wrestler in a new workplace. Likewise, the feeling of no escape and redundancy permeate each individual frame in which we can imagine the progress or lack of the day's events. The subjects are caught in the ring, trapped in a cycle of endless recommencement. The construction worker echoes um, Sisyphus. Again, you can see I've added the anchorage. Wonder Woman's laundry, just like our own, never ends. And Harvey the Birdman echoes the French expression, metro boulot dodo. Here again, the narrative traps the subjects into the persona of the workday. Their individuality evoked by their name and their hometown is lost. They are playing out the role that has been assigned to them, much as the wrestler in the ring follows his script. Visually, Pinzan confirms a lack of solution for the Mexican superheroes. The narrative created through Pinzan's use of tableau photography inserts impasse and inertia. While the fans, or rather viewers, may encourage the heroic Mexicans in their pursuit of the American dream, Pinzani makes it clear that there is little hope that they may attain it. The superhero has a mission to preserve society, not to reinvent it. Mentioned earlier, the selfless mission has been to help the Mexican community. No conflict is resolved. Tensions are perhaps even acerbated. The message is that no matter what the efforts, as long as the source of their lo loyalty lies beyond the American borders, nothing can change. The superhero isn't so super as he or she remains helpless, faced with the status quo. And to conclude, these are just a couple extracts from um, an article that accompanied this uh, series before it was published in book form, because basically the idea behind this was that when we looked at these, everyone had a very positive image. And I think with the codes of wrestling, we see that it's much more complex and much more difficult to see just the heroic aspect. And here we can see some different interpretations confirming that we have a sliding vision across uh, the American public. Thank you.